that there are hundreds of confirming witnesses which give intricate detail to the stories in the Bible. Have you ever found yourself deep in the rabbit hole with questions that no one seemed to have the answers to? Join us the first Monday of every month at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on the Endeavor Freedom YouTube channel for our Ask Me Anything series with author and researcher Gary Wayne as he sheds light on the mysteries which have us all searching together. All right, welcome everybody for another Ask Me Anything with author and researcher Gary Wayne. I'm your host, Justin James Garcia, and I welcome you, everyone. Uh, for all the longtime listeners and those who are new, I just want to let you know this format is basically a list of 14 questions that you all have submitted before the show that author and researcher Gary Wayne is going to be answering during this show and towards the last half of the show we will have time prayerfully for some live questions so please stick around and if you have some questions that you would like to present to Gary Wayne uh, please feel free to write in all caps in the chat and I will put it on the list and it's first come first serve uh, once we get to the live questions so uh, with that said, we'll go ahead and bring Gary on. Uh, Gary, are you with us, sir? I am, and thank you for having me on the show again tonight. And uh, very much looking forward to to the to the uh, discussion. If I can get my tongue untied here, and uh, yeah, it should be awesome. <laughs> yes, excellent. Well, we definitely appreciate you joining us again. I know that it was an extremely busy month, and you had the True Legends conference, and uh, I'm sure that. It, You've been very busy with a, a bunch of other shows that you've been preparing for and accomplishing. So uh, we really yeah. appreciate you joining us. How was the conference? Uh, you know, I think uh, it was had way more traffic uh, than what the organizers had um, anticipated. And they also had a viral attack. So there was uh, some issues wow. with people getting on and or just overwhelming the system, and it's hard to know which. But I think they're, they they thought that the uh, that the live streaming had a had you know was attacked by a virus. So I think oh, it had. Wow. I haven't heard the final results or anything like that. But I, you know, it seems to me that they had a lot of traffic, and I certainly had, you know, a lot of uh, email and Facebook messages and things like that, and people asking for documents and more information, and so and it's still coming in. So. That was a couple of weeks ago. So, yeah, I think I think it went over pretty well. Excellent. Well, for anybody who might be interested in hearing your speech from the True Legends Conference, where could they go to maybe uh, find that speech, and how can they actually find more information on you and your book, <laughs> The Genesis 6 Conspiracy? Yeah, so they can just go to True Legends uh, Gen Six dot uh, com uh, website, and uh, it'll it'll you know take you through to it. And you know, I don't know whether they're still offering sort of like the live feed option, uh, but they also were offering DVDs for all the different presentations. And you know, there was a, an extraordinary oh, okay. list of presenters there. So either or, I think that the uh, feed was going to be available for about you know maybe a month afterwards. So um, depending on which way uh, somebody wanted to go, that would be the best way to to, to get access to it. And I did a uh, almost a three hour presentation on the oh, alternative wow. translation to uh, the days of creation and uh, the gap theory and the real renewal of the earth. And so I made the case for that in a very detailed scriptural step by step, and then linked it to destruction by fire and end time catastrophes and threw in a few other things in there in terms of uh, prophecy that, you know, just sort of Excellent. set the whole, it was, and the idea was to set the base for the conference in terms of, because it was called, you know, basically, you know, catastrophes and cataclysms past and catastrophes future. So, um, yeah, it was a very, very, I, you know, I, I enjoyed doing it and, uh, uh, and the feedback is uh, getting a lot of feedback saying, you know, I've heard about this, but nobody's been able to explain it in a way that you did it on there. And so people are saying, can I get the documents on that? So Absolutely. That, it sounds like something that would be in a college based curriculum. Like I'm sure the three hours that, that you were presenting was 
full of sources that people could study for days. So we definitely yeah. appreciate all of the research that you've done for sharing that. And with that said, I'll go ahead and say a quick prayer and then we'll get straight into the questions. If everybody would, please just bow your head with me. We'll just lift our hearts up to the Most High. Father Yahuwah, we humble ourselves before you and we thank you, Father, for giving us life this day, for giving us the opportunity to join together again with uh, Mr. Gary Wayne and with all of those who are joining us for the YouTube live stream and all of those who will join us afterwards. We're just grateful for this platform to be able to share all of the insights and, and the research that you've led Mr. Gary to. Uh, we really appreciate you and all that you have done for us, Father. We, we thank you for the sacrifice mostly uh, for our sins and that you, you've paid for the recompense of our sins and that you died on the cross for us, that you, you offered your only begotten Son for us and that he defeated death by your power and that you've extended that promise that we also can defeat death through you and through faith in you. So in this moment, Father, we just confess that you are Savior, you are the Most High, you are the Creator, you are above all, and you are our God, Father. You are the true and only God, and we just humble ourselves and exalt you, Father, for you are greater than all of our suffering and all of our sorrows, and we just ask that you would give peace to those who are weary and uh, give strength to those who are suffering and uh, give us all courage to be able to endure whatever uh, tribulations we may come to in this future time. Uh, we ask that you would be with Gary tonight and give him wisdom to be able to answer with truth uh, all the questions that will be presented to him. And we thank you again for all the listeners and for this opportunity to join together. In the name of the Messiah, Yahusha. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, before we get into the actual question list, I just wanted to ask you real quick. There is something that, you know, is going on in America right now. And there's a lot of conspiracies surrounding it, and that being uh, this man named George Floyd, who was presented as being a victim of police brutality. And it's really fueled this race war that, uh, to me, it doesn't really exist when you, you know, I grew up in the South where there used to be slavery and definitely there was a little bit of, uh, like, bias in racism that, that lingered on. But I feel like it was never actually real until the media presents it. And then, you know, it, it goes pretty wild. But I was curious, have you heard about the connections to the Freemasons that this man had? And what were your thoughts on it? Yeah, no, I'm not familiar with his background whatsoever. Uh, so, but whether or not it's with, uh, you know, George Floyd or another individual, you still have, you know, the act that, you know, we don't want to condone in any sort of way and we need, you know, justice. And what's important about the justice part, and I'm going to come back to your point in a second, but, and I know there's so many people out there who don't have any patience for this, but um, the problem is if you don't do due process and you don't collect the proper evidence and go through all of the right steps and then do the charging and then make your case beyond a shadow of a doubt, these cases tend to get overturned if they're rushed to judgment. And that would be a worse tragedy. So... There's already been a charge. I think it's undercharged. I would hope that there would be other charges that would be laid and, and upgraded. And I would like to know, you know, afterwards as to what the information and investigation was done to the other officers that were involved. But in no way do I want to cast that as a characterization of all policemen because that's just not true and none of the statistics sort of uh, support that. The other thing I would start would say is that it wouldn't matter whether it was this case, the media and the money which is uh, funding the anarchy and the propaganda on all sorts of fronts, but particularly the media, uh, they're all part of the same cabal. They're all part of the same agenda. And, you know, our media today is a propaganda forum for left-wing fascists. And 
I make a very large distinction between liberal and progressive and further fascists as you go further to the left, but they're all part of the same group. The left continues to provide cover for these anarchist groups. They're always part of their protests. They always turn violent. They rarely do anything to turn them in, and I know there's a few cases where they're pointing them out, but they get cover, and they do their damage around the willing partners who should be absolutely separating themselves from, from the anarchists. But the, pro the thing here is there's a, an agenda here, whether or not people think this is conspiracy or not. They want to bring down the U.S. and Western countries to a poorer level. They want to have an equality level that would be similar to uh, what happened in China with the takeover of communism, where it was probably the most equal country in the world uh, because everybody was dirt poor. And only the elite had money and control and power, and that's the system that they want to bring down. Uh, uh, to, that's the system they want to set up in, in place of the democracy and an ability to raise yourself up with opportunity. So the media and the left-wing politics has been driving the race car, driving wedges between people, driving wedges between uh, religions, driving wedges between sexes, driving wedges between everything that they can just to divide people and then they can use any kind of scenario that pops up to their advantage to create anarchy. And if you look at the left-wing media or the mainstream media for the most part, they are exasperating race politics in heightening people's emotions before anything even happens. And we're getting that done in Canada as well. They're creating race events. And there is, there's, you know, and again, I'm not suggesting or trying to make a statement that I don't think that we should denounce racism and hate in all forms. I just object to the amount of attention that's continually applied to it so that they can light Western civilization on fire every chance they get by any event that will come along. Absolutely. Thank you so much for, you know, bringing that full table and letting us see, you know, there really is an agenda behind all of this. And that's why, you know, we're gathered here together because we really want to understand the underlying truths of how does this fit into the bigger picture? And I, I appreciate that answer. So with that said, we'll move on to the first question that we have from our list of 14 questions. And this one comes from Joel. He says, in the book of Revelation, when Yeshua is addressing the churches, he refers to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which he hates. What was this doctrine and why is it so despised by the Most High? The Nicolaitans is not a very well known group uh, in history. And so there's very, very little information on it. There's a lot of people who write on it, but there's not a lot of historical evidence uh, around about it. So what we do know is they were a cult that was in Antioch, uh, obviously at the time of the writing of the book of Revelation and probably, you know, the time of Jesus. And it was led by an, a person by the name of Nicolaitan or Nicholas, depending on which version of the history that, that you're reading on it. And he had an interesting set of titles, two of them that I'm familiar with. One was the conqueror and one is the destroyer. So he would be kind of like a false prophet or an antichrist type figure, which obviously would anything related to that would, you know, bring about a response from a monotheist perspective in terms of the teachings and the things that they were doing. But to get, an understanding of what was so detestable about some of these teachings is we need to understand the context of what Revelation 2 is talking about and that uh, the Nicolaitans are compared with following the teachings of Balaam. And Balaam is a false prophet in the time of the Exodus and he is hired to 
curse Israel, which he's not permitted to do, but he is encouraging and coaching and leading people to approach the Israelites as they're in in the wilderness, as they're marching around to get into the land of the covenant. And right up until the time of Israel crossing into the land of the covenant, uh, you know, across the Jordan River and the battle with uh, the Midianites where Balaam is, is, is executed. And he was executed because by Moses and Joshua because he was leading Israelites astray. And it's how he was doing it that... Uh, my recollection is in terms of the the crimes that he was doing against Israel, who had just you know converted to monotheism and actually had to spend forty years to develop that sort of faith, and yet we're still getting even after that as they begin the march towards um, marching into the land of the covenant, they're still losing people. And what's going on is that he and his followers are enticing the Israelites to uh, worship with idols and uh, idolatry and to eat food that is uh, sacrificed to idols. And, you know, a couple of the more significant laws that are laid down by God for the Israelites, and these are the ones that are tempting Israel to do this all of the time. So what does that mean for what it's talking about in, in Revelation? Uh, I think, you know, you can have the seven churches that are being talked about understood in a few different ways, and they're probably all right to a certain degree that these churches all existed in the time of, of uh, John and the writing of the book of Revelations in the time of Paul, and that there would have been an impact by the Nicolaitans at Antioch, and uh, it was probably having a spread into those early churches. Uh, one might expect that the seven churches could be analyzed as also being part of the ages of the church history coming up to the time of, of the Babylon, and thus a prophetic role for the future roles of the churches in the age. And that there would be an age of this church that was doing or being enticed in the same sort of way. And one could also look at these churches all being around as that kind of church in the end time. That all seven are reflective all the way through history and including the end time. And one specific church is seemingly... Um, eating food that's sacrificed to idols. So I would think that if it has a role with the end time in terms of that, that we're going to see that rise as we get closer to the last seven years and the rise of Babylon, that we'll have this Babylonian religion that is going to entice Jewish people and Christians to uh, worship through idolatry and to uh, eat food that is sacrificed to idolatry. And I wonder sometimes whether or not people might even, will even know if they're sacrificed uh, under idolatry, that it'll just come through the food uh, distribution system and people may not know that. I mean, but that's not really the context of what's going on here. That was just a little bit of thought that I was putting uh, into it. So when I look at all of this, this is something that is, you know, going right at the heart of the spirit and the Torah or the, or the law of, that was set down for uh, Israel and for Judah and for Christians to try and fulfill. So something that we need to be aware of, that this is a, a significant possibility as to re, be resurging as we get the rise of Babylon and perhaps the restructuring or the crumbling of Christianity as we know it. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Thank you so much for the thorough answer. And I'm so excited to move on with the more questions that we have. Uh, somebody pointed out we have a lot of 
questions from Revelation tonight, and I'm so excited because uh, you're definitely an expert in this field of study, and I appreciate you uh, being willing to share your time with us. So we'll move straight into the next question. This one comes from Eileen, and maybe um, we shouldn't take three hours to, to answer this one, but <laughs> I'm sure you could, though, and you have. For the purpose of this question, assume the gap theory of Genesis 1, 1 to 1, 2 is correct. What are the major events that you believe occurred in this time period? For example, would some of these major events include the war in heaven and Atlantis? Yeah, very, very good questions. And so, again, when I was asked to do this presentation at, at True Legends, you know, I, you know, I told Steve, uh, you know, I'm not... Uh, absolutely doctrinal on this. I think that uh, the translation works. I think that uh, a lot of events fit better in that gap between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2, and you should know that going in. And he was a little bit concerned about that. I said, but I said, that doesn't mean I can't make an extraordinary case for it. And I think I do. And uh, although uh, I think it probably does exist, it's not one of those faith issues. So I just want to make that clear for everybody. And sometimes people might think I'm a little bit wishy-washy on something, but the reason why I leave possibilities open is only because when, unless there's something that you have, you know, like smoking gun verses on that you can explicitly point to, you have to be respectful of other points of view. Uh, but I think the translation that uh, the world became void, the earth became void, and then was renewed, as Psalms 104 talks about, is is uh, a better translation. But I'm fine with either, but I think this fits better. And so if that's the case, and I think that it is, then what would be some of the events that took place between then? Well, certainly we have, according to the time of Psalms 104, and in Job 38, 4 through 7, you have even before the creation of the physical universe, you have the creation of the angels, because they're witnessing the creation in, in both of those passages. And so that's a significant event. So when were angels were created, even before the earth was created the first time. And then if the earth was destroyed somehow, how did it become destroyed? And I think that's a significant uh, question and, and event. And I think angelic rebellion fits better then than in, you know, after, you know, day day one or day two or day three, wherever people like to insert it. And then there's a few different views on that. But I just think it fits better that this angelic rebellion uh, is by very, very powerful individuals. And that the destruction and the weapons that they had had the capability of destroying the earth to its foundations, but not completely, which is why when the spirit hovers over the earth and uh, as Psalms 104 talks about, when God sends a spirit, the earth is renewed, that the earth is being renewed. And so when we look at this angelic rebellion, then we need to even think about, okay, what happened before that rebellion? And certainly there was significant harmony that was going on before. And if there was an earth that was created and not in vain, as Isaiah 45 talks about, to be lived in, then this planet had to exist in terms of physical life and to be lived in and was operated over by angels uh, with the authority of God, and these angels rebelled. And if they had that sort of authority, what were the kinds of beings that maybe we should think about that might have been in the earth at that time? And so the governing angels, as we understand them, are the seraphim angels, the fiery serpent-faced angels, who I think are the sons of God and the watchers of Daniel 4 and the watchers of First Enoch, just sort of linking in some of the premise here for it. And it's the seraphim angels that 
Um, are, are, I guess I would, you know, let me just sort of backtrack and say, like, these are, you know, the, the watchers of, uh, that are going to later on after the earth is renewed, they're going to, you know, create the sons of God in Genesis six, but they are the ones that are decreed for governance, just as they are described in Daniel four, where they permit and control the earth and dispense governing as God permits it, at least according to the watchers of Daniel 4. And in the book of Enoch, we understand that after the renewal of the earth, they were ruling the earth at that time and were leading humans astray. So one presumes then that they had governance over the earth even before, and God permits this even after the rebellion because he's letting everything play out through free choice, which will all be taken care of uh, in the lake of fire in the end time. So, they would probably have influence over the beings that were uh, being created or influencing those angels, and perhaps they did some creations that were violations at that point in time as well. And so, we have a world where you could have dinosaurs, for example as opposed to being in days one through six and before the flood and being wiped out by the flood. And again, I'm fine to put the dinosaurs either way. But when we look at what we're learning about dinosaurs today, these are reptilian beings. And before they were called dinosaurs uh, by science, uh, you know, a couple hundred years ago, you know, they were known as dragons. And of course, a dragon is a representation of a seraphim angel with wings. A dragon is a serpent with wings. And dinosaurs are now being understood more and more to have had feathers. And so they would be these very much feathered type of beings that would very much be what I would suggest maybe a favored kind of being and they were also giants just as they created giants from humans after the renewal of the earth so i think there might have been something going on there as well and understand that if the rebellion happened then like they would be violating the laws of creation back then as well and did they create beings like a nakash that was intelligent that again that would be recreated in the root renewal of the earth and was that type of being or other kinds of beings that we see being unearthed by science, whether it's Cro-Magnum or whatever type of uh, a being that you want or a serpentine type of being that would have been its most favored intelligent being. And that's why I bring up the Nakash, because Nakash was the most intelligent being and it walked and it talked and, and it was very, very smart. And it was there seemingly before Adam was created which is also another interesting concept uh, after the, in, in the renewal of the earth. So I think they were doing similar things then that they were doing after the renewal of the earth. And so all of that is going on. And so one would also expect then that the societies and the cult centers that they created at that time would be kind of similar to, again, to the cult centers that they created before the flood. And before the flood, we'd understand there could be four civilizations, uh, there could be seven, there could be nine, there could be 11, uh, and not just the one that, you know, we kind of, like a lot of people might have thought of in the past. And again, maybe there was just one, but it sounds like coming out from all the information from parallel sources and things that the Sumerians were probably the, the, the area where the biblical characters before the flood actually lived. But my point is, is if there was multiple civilizations, whether it's in Atlantis, whether it's in Mu, whether it's in Asgard or elsewhere, there would have been similar types of cult centers and, and locations in the earth before. So then that comes into the question as to, does, did Atlantis exist then? We don't know whether Atlantis connect, 
uh, existed then. Uh, the only thing that we can really connect to is Atlantis as it comes out of, let's say, uh, Plato's version in Critias and Timaeus, where it seems to fit with the creation of the ten Nephilim kings um, by Poseidon and a human female, and that that was the helm of world government, and then they turn even more evil, and they need to be taken care of with the flood. That seems to be located before the flood. But that doesn't mean that there wasn't a similar organization and set up between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. So within the Atlantean mythos and within Plato's account, Solon, when he's talking to the Egyptian priests who are showing him the... Uh, the pillars where the story is recorded on and elaborating on the story to them as, as they understand it, they tell them that the world has had several floods and several disasters before that. And so there may have been in that period before there may have been floods that happened and disasters that happened and however long that epoch was that the angels would have ruled between 1-1 and 1-2. And we have no idea how long that was, and we have no idea how long it was before the earth would have been renewed under standing that we're talking about the gap as actually being the case. So all of that could be true. We just don't have evidence of that. But I would leave open to uh, all of these underground cities that we see under the oceans. They may be part of that previous age. Um, but they may not have been. I mean, because the world was destroyed by fire. And when that world was destroyed by fire, it collapsed the, the water above back into the water below, creating chaos. So you have this world that's kind of covered in water. And that's why you have the separation of the water in the days of creation, because... You're going, to need to, you're going to have to do that to create the firmament, and you're going to have to have an ability to create land for land animals to live on. And this is what is being talked about in, in the book of, uh, of Peter, where uh, you have uh, a world that's reserved for destruction by fire for the end time, and you have a world that was in the water and out of the water, and it's reflecting this destruction in prehistory where that water uh, collapsed onto the earth and destroyed the earth and caused it to perish because the flood story doesn't fit there. And, I'll and, and the reason is that the flood story doesn't fit there is because the whole earth didn't perish. You just had the flood and you had... Noah and all the animals that were on the ark, you still had all the beings that were living in the water. So it was just the beings on the earth, but the, even the earth wasn't destroyed because it pour, put forth plants and vegetation, you know, very shortly after the flood ceases and the land and the water starts to recede. And then the earth is replenished uh, both with humans and with animals afterwards. So the earth didn't die. Whereas, in Peter, it says the earth perished, and that's that complete destruction that would have made the earth formless and void, to who and bohu, as you take that back to Hebrew. So those are the types of events and things that I think would fit better in that gap period as the question is posed, and that makes more sense of what, how we understand the world and the earth today. As expected, a very thorough and appreciated answer. Our next question also comes from Eileen. On a recent show, you addressed the Gnostic texts. My take on what you said is that you need to be cautious when interpreting these texts and that the enemy writes things for their own purposes and competitive advantage. Can you please provide a few specific examples of some Gnostic texts the enemy has written? the deception contained within them and how they spin this deception to their followers? 
It's it's a good question, and there are uh, you know a lot of uh, you know Gnostic gospels, and you know I'll give a couple examples out of this one here. That's the Gnostic scriptures. But if people are you know looking at the video, I've got another behind me five uh, collections of Gnostic gospels, and then individual books of other ones that aren't in there. And there's a lot of them. So I, I certainly can't go through, but I, I can look at a couple of examples. And what my concern is with the, with the Gnostics, other than it's a polytheist religion, um, and that when our people are reading is that it, they are very, very seductive, and they sound like they're adding some additional context and information, but you have to weigh everything against the Bible and be very, very careful that you're not being seduced away. So I'll give a couple examples of just some small things that... Um, I think um, are concerning and uh, people should be very, very aware of it. So I'm going to talk about the first one is the origin of the world Gnostic gospel. And we're going to talk about, uh, you know, chapters uh, 1, 116 um, or verse 116 in it. And it talks about day eight. Uh, which is, again, the Eden account. So in this Eden account, you have uh, Sophia, who is the wisdom figure in Gnosticism, um, through Zoe, who is called Eve. She is going to, uh, Sophia is going to send Zoe Eve to breathe life into Adam. And so Eve is actually through Sophia, the creator of Adam. And how they justify that is that um, they put Adam into a deep sleep. And then when he wakes up, they tell him that Eve was created from him and they had put him under something like hypnosis so that he would believe that. And so when you start to get those things put in a completely different meaning and order of what's happening in the Bible, you have to be suspect of anything that's going to flow out of that particular Gnostic scripture because it could be very, very subtle or a very, very small change. This, to me, is a large chain change, but it's written in the same narrative sort of context. And Sophia is you know, thought to be by a lot of people to be, and, and because you can take wisdom in the New Testament, actually goes back to the word Sophia as it's being used, and is associated then with the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. But again, we have to be very, very careful of this because Sophia is almost like the partner of the of this energy source of that creates the entire world. And Sophia is the one who creates Ial de Boath. Uh, and we get that in um, several Gnostic Gospels where she is the father of, uh, of Ial de Boath. But particularly in other Gnostic teachings, according to, to St. Irenaeus, as we get a number of things that are, that are coming together there. And so Ial de Boath is uh, the parent god who makes you know, another seven sets of angels, and there's other sets of angels other than the ones made by Alda Boath. But Alda Boath is said to be um, the god of the Jews who is an angel. And, of course, the god of the Jews is not an angel. God is, you know, the creator of all things. And so Alda Boath is also said to be the arrogant one who says that there is none beside me and he's despised by all the other authorities because he's just one of many that are equal. And he's the one who is um, being arrogant and, and leading people astray, and particularly the Jewish people. And, of course, that hits right at the whole structure of monotheism is if you say that uh, the God of the Jewish people is just another angel and that they were being lied to by an arrogant hubris angel. And so Sophia in, um, 
you know, the book, according to St. John, is the mother of Isle de Boath, again, talked about it, and is uh, the consort of an aeon to, to, to create Isle de Boath, the god of the Jews. So those are the types of doctrines. I'm not going to, and I'm not here to, um, you know, criticize Gnostic Gospels. People are welcome to, to read them and believe what they choose to believe, but they are not consistent in most of them, I'd say most all of them, uh, to what's written in the Bible, and I don't consider them apocrypha. I consider them Gnostic Gospels because the Gnostics accept that as as their doctrine and as part of their global cosmology of of mysticism. So hopefully that gives you know sort of an uh, an idea of what I'm talking about. So you need to be very well versed in Scripture so that you're not seduced by these teachings and then you can look at it and say how does some of that sort of fit or explain some things a little bit better that might be written in the bible but you use the bible as the authority so that's what i I talk about when i'm saying we want to be very careful when we're reading the gnostic scriptures absolutely that's a great caution Uh, and we appreciate the examples that you brought forward and once again i just have to say thank you for joining us and taking a Taking time out of your busy schedule to do this Ask Me Anything once a month, the first Monday of every month for all those who are new, uh, author and researcher Gary Wayne joins us for this Ask Me Anything series, and it's been awesome so far. I'm really excited to hear your take on this next question as well, as we have a lot of Revelation study going on tonight. Maybe we should title the video Revelation Study. This one comes from MJM. Where will the rapture take place in relation to the seven-year tribulation? Right before this period, or in the middle, or at some point, uh, some other point in time? And again, I want to be respectful of everybody's views on rapture, and uh, this is again not a faith issue, so uh, I don't want people to, I wouldn't advise people to raise uh, their understanding of the timing of the rapture to a faith issue. Uh, my position on it is uh, comes at it from how I approach Scripture, which uh, I'm not going to run through all the things in terms of my approach tonight, but if somebody comes in the chat room they want to know it, I will talk about it. Um, so where I come from with rapture is I, you know, my heart And my prayers are for pre-trip, because nobody should want to go through the tribulation of uh, the of the end times. Uh, But my brain and my research in Scripture says that that's likely not going to be the case. And so, I place the timing for me based on my research um, to be about. Uh, a period that is after the midpoint of the last seven years. And I'm not sure how far into the last three and a half years that that comes about, but certainly it comes before the wrath bowls are poured out because we know that uh, the saints or the first fruits uh, will be saved from the wrath. So they're not going to be involved in the time of the day of the Lord or be affected by the day of the Lord of wrath, and the day of the Lord could be a year. And there's also a year of the Lord's favor that has another event going on, and I think that might be a year separate from the day of the Lord. So if we have three and a half years in the last uh, uh, part of the tribulation, then you have two of those three and a half years Filled, which means somewhere in the first year and a half, uh, and likely not at the time where people are having to make the choice to take the mark of the beast or not, because those people are clearly risen after Armageddon to reign with Christ. Those are beheaded for not taking the reign. So sometime after the middle, um, sometime. Uh, before the hour of testing, as Revelation will talk about. And Revelation of testing is a very interesting word 
because in Revelation 17, you have an hour where the 10 kings of the end time empire reigned over by Babylon at this point in time will hand their power over to the beast and destroy Babylon, who is the city of, of power and in, in, in the city of the religion of, of Babylon. And so we know it's a city because it says that in Revelation 17, and we know who destroys it. That's Antichrist, who's going to destroy it, along with rising to power. So this is a mid-trib or slightly just after event. And so Antichrist will either do that after being crowned Antichrist in the, in, in the temple, which is clearly at the three-and-a-half-year point, or do it just before. I think he's crowned, then he gets the... He gets the power, he's crowned, and then I think they destroy uh, Babylon and he, they set up, he sets up his own religion. And so you also have Babylon in Revelation 18 being destroyed in an hour. So how long is an hour? We don't know. It could be a season, it could be a day, it could be uh, three months, it could be, I mean, but it's a short, shorter period of time than, let's say, a day would be, which is, you know, thought to be a prophetic year. And so I think somewhere in that event, in that period, in that season, is when the rapture is going to happen shortly thereafter. And so that's where I kind of fall on it. And I think that's backed up by uh, what Jesus has to say when he places uh, the timing of the rapture in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and backed up by Luke 17 and 21, is that you have the abomination, and then you have uh, another tribulation that's going to take place. And there's two tribulations, but I'll come back to that in a, in, in, in a second. And so you have the abomination, and then after that, you have a tribulation that's going to come on the world, and you have the sign of Jesus being portrayed in the sky. So I think Jesus lays out a chronology before the midpoint of the last seven years. And that happens before Jesus talks about the abomination. In Matthew, we'll use Matthew in this, and that's verses 15 through 20. And then after the abomination is the last three and a half years. And how do I know that there's two tribulations, you have the word in Matthew 24, uh, 9, as I recall, the word affliction. And in, in Matthew 24, 29, and Matthew 30, you have the word tribulation. The thing is, is both of those words go back to the word Philippians, which is the word for tribulation and the word for affliction and for persecution. And they're used interchangeably. So if you look at, you know, like comparative verses of Matthew and Mark. So Matthew 24, 9, you have tribulation or affliction being used. And then you get the details of this persecution. And then you have uh, in Mark, you don't have a reference to affliction. You just get a description of the persecution. But as you move forward, you have in, in Matthew 24, 21, uh, uh, you have the word tribulation being used. And in Mark 13, in a comparable verse, you're going to have, um, let's just make sure that I get these, these verses right. And I'm not conflating them. Um, you have, uh, have affliction, as, as I recall. But anyways, it, and, and then Matthew will have tribulation. So they sort of revert and flip over. And elsewhere in um, passages in the Bible where you're going to have things talked about tribulations, because it's used a lot, you're going to have tribulation and affliction sort of used even in the same verse as, as interchangeably. So and that would come in, let's say, first Thessalonians uh, 3, 3 through 4, where you have uh, affliction and tribulation used in the same narrative. So hopefully I, I'm, I'm being kind of clear on that. So you have this tribulation that is happening in the first three and a half years. And these are the saints that are shown that come out of the great tribulation 
as it's described in Revelation 7. They're the ones that the first fruits were told to wait for that were going to be uh, killed like they were. These are the first fruits. These aren't the ones who died in Christ. These are the first fruits as part of the first fruits. And that's the great tribulation of the saints, as opposed to the great tribulation that Matthew is talking about after the abomination, which is the tribulation that comes upon the world, as opposed to the saints. So there's two distinct tribulations that are going on here, and that where a lot of people get tripped up is in Revelation 7, you have the saints coming out of the Great Tribulation, and yet Jesus is talking about the Great Tribulation that comes on the world in the last three and a half years, and actually says Great Tribulation there. So I get where people get confused, but you clearly have two sets of tribulations because it says in Matthew that after the tribulation of those days, the first three and a half years, you have another tribulation. And there's two, one of the saints, one of the whole world. And uh, one of the biggest proponents for saying that the tribulation will be pre-trib is based on 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 7. And in there, uh, you actually get a chronology uh, that you're going to have to have the falling away or the apostasy before the gathering. And in Matthew 24, you get this word offended, which actually means falling away or being seduced or um, entrapped, which is talking about the same time frame, which is the first half. And you have the restrainer um, being mentioned as you move further on into that in a verse, you know, I think a verse about six or seven, and that um, the Antichrist will not be revealed, which is defined in Second Thessalonians as being crowned in the temple at the abomination until the restrainer is is removed. And so the proponents of this say of, of, of the pre-trib will say that the restrainer is the Holy Spirit, and I'm fine with that. I also think it could be Michael, but using the argument of the pre, pre-trib people of their particular view, they look at um, the restrainer being removed with the church. So after the restrainer is removed, that is the time of the rapture and the church is removed. And therefore, that would have to be at the revealing of the Antichrist, usually timed with the confirming of the covenant that starts the last three and a half years. But here's the interesting thing. In Luke's version of the same set of events that uh, Jesus is talking about in terms of this time of affliction, you have an instruction being laid out for that future people not to worry about what they're going to say because they're going to be given the spirit of wisdom, which is, you know, that word that goes back to Sophia, but this tends to be a description that is used wisdom for the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit seems to be there, and it's the Holy Spirit that's going to be telling them what to say. And this is the the same thing that Mark says, only Mark is more explicit in Mark 13 that is don't be worried about what you're going to say. It's going to be the Holy Ghost that's, that's going to be speaking through you. So clearly the Holy Spirit is there. So if that is in the first three and a half years, because that happens before the abomination in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, then if the argument for pre-trib is that the Holy Spirit has been removed as a restrainer and rapture has happened, well, it, the restrainer is still there. So that doesn't make any sense. And so a lot of people might say that, and, and I'm not here to knock down all the arguments, I'm just explaining my position in terms of the logic of the timing of how I arrive at it. You have, have this understanding as well that um, Jesus is, and, and you've probably heard that, that Jesus is not speaking to the church. He's speaking to the Judeans. Well, that doesn't make any sense. And let me tell you why. For a couple of reasons in my own mind, it doesn't make sense in terms of logic. Is because in the first three and a half years, the people of Judea 
are going to be thinking that Antichrist uh, is the one and Babylon who have made their way to do the sacrifice on a wing of the temple. And they're going to be very, very happy about that. And they're going to be actually be deceived, be deceived that Antichrist is going is their is their Messiah. And they won't actually recognize that he is not Messiah until the time of the abomination. So when that happens, then they flee. So they're not the ones that are standing up. Well, then the other thought might be is, well, it's awakening Israel. But that's not who Jesus is talking about. He's talking to the Judeans. And when you get further into when Jesus makes a sign in the last three and a half years, on the back half, after the abomination, that he sends out the angels to gather his elect, again, they'll say, that's not talking to Christians. Even though these are the future disciples and the builders of the Christian church, um, Apparently, they're not talking to the future Christians in this prophecy. They're, they're talking to the Jewish people, which, again, doesn't make any sense. And they only recognize Jesus at the time of the sign because they see the wounds that I think are going to be part of the sign. And then they're going to mourn the one they priest. So this testifying with the Holy Spirit through the Jewish people doesn't make sense from that perspective as well. And when... The trump sounds, and which is the last trumpet in Revelation 7, and by chronology that's pushing you into the midpoint and just after of the last seven years, they are going to collect the angels, going to collect the elect. And the elect, as you take that back to Greek, is electos, which means those who accept Jesus as their savior. And so this is clearly referring to Christians as part of the bride for the collection. And just as Judea and awakened Israel who are uh, recognizing who they are in the last three and a half years are going to recognize Jesus also as their Messiah and will be led in second Exodus. And at that point in time, be judged as Ezekiel 37 talks about and joined. Uh, and another resurrection with the, with, with the uh, dry bones, so all Israel can be judged by Jesus. At that point in time, they also are converters to Jesus as their Messiah, and in time for the bride, and in the year of the Lord's favor, and before the day of the Lord, so that the bride is complete for the supper that is talked about in Revelation. So, I'm not going to go through every aspect, but that sort of gives you a kind of an idea why my research leads me to a timing. And one thing that I always try and consider is not to have thing, have verses in conflict and not to leave out inconvenient verses so that everything has to fit. The only way everything fits that I've come across is slightly after the midpoint of the last seven years. Excellent, thorough answer. We appreciate it. As always, it is 8.57. I think it's time to take a quick break. We'll get a sip of water and play a trailer or two, and we'll be right back. We are constantly studying alone. But there is a place where we can come together. The Digital Readers Club is our online ecclesia, meant for those who've forsaken churchianity, but still want the closeness of a family to study with. Join us every Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time to put together the puzzle pieces of truth scattered throughout the ancient scriptures. Hello everybody, as you know, in our Digital Readers Club, we just finished the Great Commission 3 on the end time apocalypses and are now moving forward because of your vote into the Yahushua Christ, the infancy, gospels, early childhood, and lost year narratives. And so in this particular book, and the reason I compiled it is because there's only one account in the entire Bible that relays anything with regard to the youth of Christ. And it is the story of when he's 13 years old and he um, leaves Mary and Joseph and they 
retracing them st their steps, find him teaching the rabbis and the elders in the Holy Temple, the Jerusalem Temple, about the mysteries of the heavens. And so I wanted those of us that are believers and that hold and have faith in Christ to have the fullness of the stories and the accounts of his early life that are available to those that wish to know more. And so that was the reason for the compilation of all of these accounts is to give you better insight into who our Savior Messiah is and how he was, even in his youth, without question, he was the fullness, the incarnation of God, and that he had the authority, even then, of life and death, and that Mary used even his bathwater and his swaddling clothes to heal leprosy and to bring people out of their demonic possessions. And so I believe that the study of this material will greatly bless your life and help you to better understand the core tenets of why we believe on him and know without question that salvation is through him. Your partnership with Sacred Word Publishing goes further than the publishing of ancient manuscripts and weekly video content. You also make a huge impact across the earth in orphanages in Myanmar, India, Uganda, and Kenya. Your support is crucial for the development of the Ecclesia of Real Truth Seekers. We thank you for joining us in hosting Secrets Revealed, Momentary Zen, the Digital Readers Club, Ask Me Anything series, and other shows that have helped lead so many to the truth of salvation. To become even more involved, please visit patreon.com slash sacredwordpublishing where you can partake in exclusive, interactive, patron-only content and help us continue shining the light of love in this darkened world. All right, welcome back, everyone. We'll go ahead and get straight back into the live or into the pre-made listed questions before we get into the live questions prayerfully at the end of the episode tonight. So, Gary, did you have a chance to get some water, sir? So it's nice to have a break. And uh, I thought maybe with the last question in terms of the rapture, and, and, and I do get, you know, fairly intense sometimes and passionate on my answers. So, Again, I understand there's different points of view, but those are, you know, some of the reasons why I come uh, about it. And, uh, you know, if people, you know, if they know me, um, they say, well, I thought you came back to uh, the Bible and to God and Jesus via Hal Lindsey, and he, he's a pre-trib uh, individual, and uh, they're right. I don't know whether people can see it, actually have um, the book that Hal Lindsey wrote um, in the 80s uh, about the rapture, and he details it. And he did a, an extraordinary job of detailing his position and the other positions exactly what they were. And I hadn't even considered at that point in time uh, when the rapture would happen or what the rapture was or how important it was to the end time. And uh, so he made as one of his key arguments was that argument that I was talking about in terms of the church being removed with the restrainer and then the restrainer was the Holy Spirit in that book. And I respect that. It's just that it doesn't seem to match up to what scripture says. And so I let scripture sort of allow me to go where I, where I want to go. And, and I'm always learning. And if I have to make some adjustments with, in terms of my approach, it allows me to do that because it's about getting it right. So um, I'm always open to arguments. And most of them I've, I've answered. I haven't heard anything on rapture in the last, you know, five or 10 years that 
has changed anything that because uh, uh, the problem is with a lot of the arguments that come to me on it is that they conflict with other scriptures. So when that happens, that's a problem uh, in terms of my approach. Now, when I was talking about the detail on the two tribulations, uh, I have a very good document on that. And uh, it's part one and part two. So part one is the first three and a half years. And then part two deals with the tribulation of the second three and a half years. Get a hold of me on that through my website, Genesis 6 Conspiracy. If you want that scriptural blow by blow sort of account of it, I'll give it to you with all of the footnote sources and the Greek words and the meanings and things and the applications. You'll get all of that if, if you want that. Or if uh, and you, this this would require a, sub, sub, a subscribe membership, but I do a show twice a month on the Daily Renegade with Josh Peck, and I did a two part series on it where I walk through it, and then I supply the document on that for for the for the backup on it. But if, when you hear it, and I'm offering, it's the same document that I'm talking about right now. So, um, two ways of uh, getting a little bit more information on that. Excellent. And how can people get in touch with you again? Through the website is the best way. Is uh, There's a email access on the genesis6conspiracy.com. That's www.genesis6, the number 6conspiracy.com. And or through Twitter at GaryWayne63 and or on Facebook. And I have my timeline that's under Gary Wayne. And also have a couple of Genesis 6 conspiracy pages and also the group that uh, has my name and, and uh, book name on it that uh, if uh, you ask me a question in there and my name is mentioned, uh, I'll, I'll, respond to, I'll respond to the question. Excellent. All right. Well, we will move on to our fifth question that comes from MJM. Other than the War of Armageddon, are there any other major wars that take place during the seven-year tribulation, like World War III? Does the Gog and Magog War take place during the seven-year tribulation, or does this occur during the end of the millennial reign? There are a couple questions mm -hmm. in there. Very, very good uh, question, and important in terms of understanding the chronology and uh, trying to match up Revelation with other prophecies. So, excellent question. So, yes, there are more wars. And let me preface it that when Jesus gives his opening to the end uh, time signs and his second coming, he talks about wars and rumors of war, along with pestilence, along with earthquakes, along with fat. Um, um, along with famines, as being part of the beginning of sorrows or um, birth pangs, as that would be defined in terms of uh, Isaiah 13, Hosea 13, and a few other chapters of the Old Testament for that allegory. And that means that uh, wars and rumors of war as a birth pang will increase in intensity and shortening between pangs the closer you get to the end time and particularly into the last seven years that I think the seals and the trumpets and the wrath bulls basically represent, although I do leave open that the seals could start to be open just before the last of uh, the last part of the seven years. So uh, I'm certainly very open to that in terms of how the seals are worded with the uh, with the riders. Um, I won't go into that right now because that that might take a little bit of time to explain. But understand that there are wars in Revelation six. Of the seals, there, there's a war of the 200 million man war in Revelation 9, and then you have the Armageddon war. And there are more wars than that. So let's start with the Revelation 9 war that happens in the last seven years. And as we're closing in on the midpoint, uh, not at the midpoint, but within probably a year of the midpoint, somewhere in that kind of zone, I think. And maybe even six months before, but somewhere in that sort of zone. And you have 200 million man army. And this is the war that is going to be usurped by Antichrist to give him credibility as being Jesus coming back at Armageddon. So it's going to be the counterfeit Armageddon. That's the Joel 1 and 2 war as it's described. And it's the same type of uh, military 
creatures or beings or weaponry that is being talked about in Joel 1 and 2 that matches up with the, the beasts uh, that are described in the 200 million man war. This is also the Gog War that's in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And I know there's a Gog War that's described at the end of Revelation 20, at the end of the millennium. That's a separate war. That's another. That's after Satan is released from the abyss and he stirs up the descendants of Gog and Magog again. And they repeat uh, almost verbatim what is going on at, as you get towards the midpoint of the last seven years with this Gog War. And we know the Gog War is in the end time as opposed at the end of Revelation. So two separate wars because of two key details that are put into place. One is in Ezekiel 38 where it says this happens in the latter times. And that's the end times as you take that back in other applications in the Bible and to its meaning. Latter times is the end times. The second thing that gives us the timing is that after the slaughter of the armies of Gog and Magog and the, and the alliance of, country, uh, of countries that are with them, you're going to have Israel being gathered back, which is the second exodus. And that has a timing that happens in the second and a half of the uh, last three and a half years in the year of the Lord's favor when Jesus will lead exodus of awakened Israel who has been imprisoned in the last three and a half years and visible Judea around the world to meet up with the people of Jerusalem and Judea who had previously fled to the wilderness at the midpoint of the last seven years at the abomination also recorded in Revelation 12 that gives you a three and a half year period of that protection where God will protect them and they are taken there on the wings of eagles which is the same set of metaphor allegory that's used in the exodus uh, of, of coming out of Egypt. So the wings of eagle, again, uh, a wording that you match up with, with exodus in this case. Second exodus, and this is the exodus of Ezekiel 37, after you get past the resurrection of the dry bones of all past Israel to be judged, uh, you have... Israel from around the world being regathered so everybody can be joined and go under the rod and the judgment of Jesus who will have led them there. So again, all of that timing in Ezekiel 37, 38, and 39 will mark the timing for you. And that's the great thing about prophecy. If you can understand the markers, you can peg the timing. So that's a very significant war, but there are more wars. So in Daniel 11, after... Antichrist moves his armies into the Jerusalem area, just as Luke describes, and he sets up the abomination. Then we get a few other wars that he's going to do after that. That includes what we're told uh, in Daniel 11, which would be Moab and Egypt for sure. And I think there's going to be some other countries that he's going to be invading and, and having some wars. I don't know what's going to cause the war, but he's going to have that. And then in the book of Zephania, which, and it's a great little book with three um, chapters in it, it gives you some highlights of the last three and a half years. So the inhabitants of Jerusalem, after Judea has fled, they're going to be punished. And that's where... Uh, Antichrist is going to rule from because he's destroyed Babylon and the Babylon city that I think is Rome. Um, other people have other opinions, but he sets up shop in Jerusalem because the Babylon city has been destroyed. And he's going to rule from there, I think. And so in Zephania, you get that recorded. And then you also get, as part of the last three and a half years of, you know, the time of the day of the Lord, as it's being described, you also have a marker timing, the Exodus again. And there's also a set of wars or punishments that are going on for other countries that I think Antichrist, as the Assyrian is going to be um, led to do, and Assyrian is an allegory for Antichrist, uh, Philistines, Cush, um, and a couple other uh, nations, as I recall, are also going to be punished. So it's going to settle some of the old uh, 
let's say, wounds and scars of how countries violated Israel throughout the millennia. Um, but because Israel is being brought back into the Holy Covenant and being recalled by name and will be part of the bride, that's all going to be settled. Those nations are, are going to be settled. So we have those wars that are going on also uh, in the last uh, three and a half years. So, um, and they will be, you know, very intense wars as this is, you know, a time that Jesus talks about, unlike anything that we've seen since creation, this is the tribulation of the world and the bull wrath start to come out in sometime in that point in time in the last year, I think, but they could start a little bit sooner. Excellent. Thank you for the thorough answer as always. Our next question comes from Carl. In Genesis 4, when God banishes Cain, Cain says to God, I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Cain and Abel were the first children of Adam and Eve. They have just been expelled from Eden. So who wants to kill Cain? Are there already people outside of Eden? Well, there aren't, according to the standard doctrine. And so then who would he be afraid of? And the standard doctrine that people buy into is that, a lot of people buy into is that this is a reference to future people that are going to want to kill Cain because they're going to live to a long age. I mean, you know, uh, Adam lived to be, you know, over 800 years and Noah 950 years. So people of that period lived to be a long period of time. But we know that Cain leaves Adam and Eve and he goes east to Nod. And we know the world is quite big and we know the population is quite small. So he could go to the ends of the world and people would recognize him you know, and or even find him for a long period of time if he wanted to hide. So I'm not convinced it's the future generations as much. I think as the person asking the question here, Carl, is wondering whether or not there was people existing at that period of time, and then who were they? And uh, I think I think there were people there. And I'll start by saying that when he when when Cain goes east of uh, Eden, and Eden is in Mesopotamia, I'm not sure where that is, but you know, by, as we know the geography today, that would be more towards uh, the subcontinent of India. How far east we don't know, but when he gets there, he builds a city. Builds a city for who? There's just him. <laughs> And he finds a wife. Well, how is that possible? And uh, he names the first city after his son Enoch. So where does the wife come from? We're not told that. Again, the people that would go uh, would suggest that there were no other people other than the standard doctrine that at this time there's only Adam, Eve, and Cain would say that Cain would have taken a wife from the lineage of Seth. And that Seth would have taken a wife from other offspring of Adam and Eve, in, in, in this case would be a sister, and then at some point in time Cain takes a wife. But that's not really what the story says. And it doesn't really add up mathematically. And so if we go back to the Cain and Abel story and we understand that this whole killing of Abel thing comes around with offering the first fruits of a, of a, a crop and that Cain's offering isn't considered to be righteous because he didn't give the first of the fruits and that this would probably have been their first offering as adults so that means they would have been somewhere between 20 and, let's say, 40 years old based on this kind of chronology, and that they, Cain would have uh, been sent off somewhere under being under 40 years old, and even if he's 50, but that's starting to get 
to be a fairly long length of time to do the first season of crops and the first season of raising of animals and the first fruit offering. So that doesn't make some sense. I would put that uh, with them probably in their 20s or maybe early 30s at the, at the latest. And Seth isn't born until Adam is 130 years old. So unless Adam and Eve are in in Eden for an extraordinary long period of time before being ostracized and then having Cain, then there's no way that uh, there could be siblings, and in this case, sisters uh, of Seth born because there aren't, they aren't even born until sometime after Seth is born. And so the understanding that Cain takes a wife immediately and then has the first child, Enoch, son of Cain, not to be confused with Enoch, son of Jared, two different Enochs in the two different lineages, doesn't seem to stack up, let alone the mark. So who's he, who's he, who's he afraid of? Probably people who are still there. So the only thing that makes sense of this, and the only thing that makes sense of the account to me in terms of how I approach my research is that the Bible isn't in conflict with the details that are in the Cain account and the details that are in the Eden account and the details that are in the day six account for that not to be in conflict because the details in the Eden account are completely at odds with the details in the day six account, then there has to be two different creations. You have the people of day six being created and then after on day eight, you have uh, Adam being created, and there could be even a thousand years if a day is a thousand years, as, as Peter talks about. Same verses that I was talking about in chapter that I was talking about previously with the gap theory, then there'd be a fairly long period of time before Adam is created before the people of day six. And it starts to explain the dis diff different order of things and the different de details. So I think what is going on here is that there are all of these different people uh, around the world that are being governed over by the rebellious angels. And there are cult centers and civilizations and that, Cain is afraid of them, and he may be afraid of future Sethites that may come looking for him down the road, but I think immediately he's quite fearful uh, of the people that are already there, and they would be of a different race, even though they're both man in Genesis 1 and in Genesis 2 both come from Adam, um, but they would be perhaps of a different skin color. And one might presume that that's where the four skin colors initially came from, were the people of day six. And Adam could be one of those four or another color that's created. We're not sure of that detail scripturally, but I think that's where it comes from. So I think that's where the people come from. And I am more doctrinal on that in my own view because I do not believe that the Bible is in conflict. And again, with the way that I think I've laid out and explained the details, I think it makes more sense. Uh, and it certainly takes away all the different conflicts. Absolutely. It definitely makes sense. And we appreciate your answer again. The next question comes from Tim. Revelation 6-2, holding a bow and giving a crown to the rider on the white horse who goes out conquering and to conquer... Gary, is this bow like a prize or award as well as the crown given to the rider? What are your thoughts and beliefs on this verse? <laughs> I think I said uh, I think I said in the first half that um, I probably didn't have time to go down that rabbit hole, but now I do apparently. Yes, so we're gonna do. go down that rabbit they hole. They also comment that the four horses, <laughs> white, red, black, and green or pale are the same colors of the Islamic nation's flags. Very interesting. Yeah, so let's take on, on the, the first part. So typically the understanding of uh, Genesis or Genesis, uh, Revelation 6-2 uh, with the writers is that um, the terminology, a bow in conjunction with a crown and a conquer, 
suggests that the bow would be, you know, a bow of war, a weapon of war, and thus an, an, an allegory of armies conquering the world, and thus this would be Antichrist rise to power through conquering the world. The trouble with that is, is Antichrist doesn't use that to conquer the world. He takes advantage of wars and he usurps power by convincing the ten kings to support him over Babylon uh, and then is crowned as such um, as, uh, as God in the temple at the midpoint of the last seven years, known as the abomination. So when we look at that word bow, it's time to have a closer look at that. It's time to take it back to Greek and Hebrew. And one of the reasons why I like to verify translations and understanding, not only with you know several other translations that I like to use other than the King James Version, and I use that as well, but I also like to, when I want to drill down on Versus, I'll take it back to Greek or Hebrew. In this case, the New Testament, it's Greek, so we'll take it back to Greek. And bow is the Greek word, uh, if I'm pronouncing it right, uh, tuxon, or tuxon, T-U-X-O-N. And it's defined as a garment or a fabric. Um, and that does not line up with an arrow and a bow, and a weapon of war. And it's rooted in the Greek word uh, tiktu, or tikto, to bring forth, um, to, to uh, be born, to travai, as in the birth pangs, um, and obviously bring forth through a birth. So for some way of tying this together, it's like... This writer is going to create a fabric or create a birthing that is related to crowning, probably of kings, and that will lead to crowning of Antichrist. And a fabric as people coming together, as a garment being knitted together, that will conquer the world or set up the new world order, but not necessarily through a military basis. There may be wars and rumors of wars that accelerate this process of Babylon, which is rising at this period of time and is going to control the New World Empire as she rides the seven empires and the seventh empire of the last time and controlling it is probably the one that's going to sponsor the formation of this New World government. And I think that's what is going on here. And the application of what is going to happen with this conquering of the world is going to lead to the sealed judgments where you have 25% destruction. So you're going to get more war. Uh, and so as this is happening, either just before the start of the last seven years as Babylon is rising, that might be where that 25% is coming from, or you might have that just afterwards. But because in Daniel 9, 27, when, when Antichrist confirms this covenant, this fabric, as, I, as I'm trying to weave this together, that starts the last seven years. So I think this happens probably just before the last uh, seven years. And I think that starts to answer the question again in Revelations where there's going to be 10 days of tribulation. And again, we don't know whether a day is a year there, but if it's a year, then that means there's seven years of tribulation plus an additional three. And that means there could be this great tribulation that's setting up the opportunity for Antichrist to negotiate a world covenant that is going to guarantee the safety of Israel or the people of Judah to be more accurate and will permit them to do the sacrifice on a wing of the temple. So I think that is likely um, what is going to be happening here. Uh, in terms of the uh, the colors, the colors have meaning based on ancient history as opposed to somebody might be adopting that. It's possible that Islam adopted those colors based on revelation or it, but I think that's probably more than more like coincidence than not. And I think the writers are, 
the same beings that are on the four chariots in Zechariah. And these are spirit beings, as you take the, the wording back to uh, Greek and the same type of wording back to Hebrew in Zechariah. These are the four winds of prophecy and the four winds of empires. And these are the beings that bring about the world empire's past and the end time world empire. So again, all of the allegory starts to make sense. And again, I've got a great set of documents on the seal judgments where I explain who the winds are, the spirits are, how they're connected to the winds of prophecy and how they connect to some other prophecies. I think it's a three part series. People want that in more detail. Um, get a hold of me and I'll send you that document. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm definitely glad that you brought up Zechariah uh, regarding the four horsemen and how they are spirit beings. And I, I definitely think that if you haven't studied the book of Zechariah, you definitely should. It's an amazing study. All of those uh, minor prophet books are just jam packed full of information that will really expound your knowledge of how Revelation actually fits together. Well, and to underline that, it helps in Daniel, too, if you match up Zechariah and, and, and Revelation with uh, uh, the writers, that this, this, yes, uh, these four, four winds of, of the empires comes up a few times in Daniel. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for pointing that out as well. So I think the whole Bible is probably a good read. <laughs> <laughs> that, too. <laughs> yeah. so we'll move on. Our next question comes from Tim also. He says in Matthew 24, 29, Mark 23, 24, when the sun is darkened and uh, the moon doesn't give her light. And in Revelations 8, 1, when the star falls from heaven unto the earth and is given a key to the bottomless pit, the sun turns black and the moon has no light and the bottomless pit is open. Seems a lot of extremely cataclysmic events occur. Do you think that the earth is going to go through a 90 degree magnetic polar shift according to Joshua 10 12 well I don't know in Joshua um, 10 12 whether or not there was a 90 degree magnetic polar shift and it's a I'll have to do some research in terms of what that actually means um, but I do know the Sun stood still in that verse and so um, that wasn't cataclysmic um, but it was miraculous and uh, something the world had, had not seen before. But what Tim is talking about is some um, horrific um, sets of destruction that happens in um, not only the last seven years, but even before that. So when you see the sun darkened and and uh, the stars not showing light and the moon being hidden and the sun not showing light. This is part of what happens in the birth pangs as we get closer to the last seven years with the wars and the rumors of wars. And all of these signs are interconnected and we'll be working together as we get closer to the last seven years. And so when you look at Revelation um, 6 with the seal openings, you have, you know, famine and pestilence and wars kind of all tied together and death just as you do in those same birth pangs that are described in Matthew 24, um, 7 and 8. And so as part of that, so let me just sort of explain that. War would be a great example that will lead to pestilence and famine as a consequence. And disasters like huge earthquakes can lead to pestilence and disaster. So they tend to be interconnected. Wars and earthquakes or volcanoes going off and stuff like that can create a darkening of the sky, the sun, and the moon. So I think that's going to be uh, part of not only the birth pangs, but these are the same signs and patterns that happen at the seal judgments where 25% happens at the time of the opening of the abyss and the trumpets, uh, where, you know, the sky is uh, shown to be so you get the same description that's happening 
uh, in Revelation 16 with the world of the Empire of the Beast being darkened, and then you have the Armageddon War. And certainly when you match that back in with Matthew 24 and Mark 20, uh, and Mark uh, version is that um, you have a darkening of the skies. And as we talked about earlier, if you look at the chronology that Jesus lays down, this is the tribulation of the last three and a half years. So they wouldn't be the birth pangs darkening. It wouldn't be the seal ones and it wouldn't be the trumpets. It would be coming from the last three and a half years and those wars and the wrath bowls and the darkening of the, uh, the, Antichrist empire descriptions that are talked about in, in Revelations. Now, whether or not that is a 90 degree polar shift, I don't know. But what I do know is there's going to be, you know, so much destruction. It's just going to fill the heavens with, uh, with, uh, darkness. And, you know, we've also got going on in there, uh, Revelation 12 with the war in heaven. So you've got all of these, cataclysmic events going on in heaven with what one can only presume great destruction that's going on in the heavens that would help, you know, darken the skies as well. And also in Matthew and in Mark, you have the powers of heaven being shaken, um, which is also very important for the timing because powers goes back to the word dunamis, which is one of the ranking hierarchies of angels, just as powers can also in other verses go back to the word um, excusia, as, as I recall. And uh, so again, you have to be careful of the application, just as with tribulation, that it can be used, uh, the English word could be used for the same or different Greek words, and you have to be uh, understanding it in the context of the narrative and and. and, and identifying the differences to, so that you're not getting them confused. But when we're talking about the powers of heaven being shaken, it happens at the midpoint or slightly after, which is the same timing as the wars that are going on in Revelation um, 12, when all the angels are sent down to the earth um, after the war uh, and are led by Satan, who will all be here in the last three and a half years. And then Daniel Eight talks about again at the midpoint after he's crowned he's going to try and raise his throne into heaven as satan tried to do as recorded in isaiah 14 and he's actually going to bring down some of the starry host and trample on them which again is part of what i think of the powers part of the powers of heaven are shaken that's all part of this and then also enter in you got the angels coming out of the abyss in the Revelation 9 and Azazel, uh, Abad, and Apollyon leading the impassioned and the worst of the angels out of the abyss. That happens, I think, just before the Gog uh, War, which is the 200 million man war and the Joel 1 and 2 War. Excellent. I appreciate the answer on that one. Our next question comes from Milford. Were there 70 nations before the flood, or was this division only after the flood? And could you please name off a few of the pre-flood nations? Well, we don't get a lot of pre-flood nations uh, listed in Genesis. Uh, we only know the nations that Cain would have went to in Nod. And we know that Eden was located in Mesopotamia, so one presumes that's the antediluvian Sumerian nation. So whether or not Cain went to the empire of Mu, because a lot of people think Mu, as it comes out of uh, polytheist uh, mythology and religions, would have been in the area of India or in the ocean area of, of India. Now, it doesn't say that Cain went into an island in the ocean or anything like that, but that would be probably one of those antediluvian nations as we get that out of uh, other religions and mythology that kind of makes some sense. And in the Vedas and the Upanishads and the uh, all the various holy scriptures um, coming out of Hinduism, um, they have their understanding that their civilization was there, um, 
before the flood as well. So uh, it would make sense that it's likely that nation, whatever they were called, is where you know Cain would have went to. So those are about the only two that scripturally that we could um, get names for. But in out of polytheism, there's you know there's Atlantis, uh, there is Egypt. Um, there is now Egypt can also be considered part of the um, Atlantean Empire. Uh, you also have Asgard, which would be a northern uh, or Thule, as it's also um, conflated with. They could be separate ones, but I think they're talking about the same one in mythology. You also have these uh, countries and nations that are across the ocean. Um, that are in Central America and South America that are part of the Atlantean Ten Nation Empire. So, um, and there's ten of these locations that are part of the Atlantean Empire. So, do you want to split that up as separate empires or peoples, or in, in an alliance, therefore, of these separate civilizations? That's probably more accurate. So that would include, you know, into modern day or post-Diluvian England and Ireland and over into Spain and locations like that. So where do the 70 nations that come from? Well, when we look to Deuteronomy 32, verses 7 through 9, we get an accounting of the sons of Israel. Um, and that's not a mistranslation. Um, it, it comes from... Uh, the word 3478, which is uh, Israel and El as the hyphenated part of the word, which Israel will take their name for. And it literally is two words. El is in God or angel and um, Israel, which comes rooted from Sarah and it has a meaning of uh, the almighty God or the God most high. And so the sons of Israel are the adopted name that Jacob is going to take that's going to be the sons of, of, of God, which, he, you know, biblically Israel is called the firstborn allegorically of God, even though they're, they're not the firstborn, that's an allegory. So how do we match that up now? So we have uh, the sons of Israel as they were born in Egypt. So the number of the nations are the number that uh, of the sons of Jacob born in Egypt. And we get that coming out as uh, out of Genesis 46 uh, as 70. And I think that's verse 27. And then you have the sons, uh, the amount of nations that come out of Noah's descendants that are listed in First Chronicles and or Genesis 10, and the patriarchs for those nations have a numerical count of 70. And these are the same num numbers as according to the sons of Adam. So one presumes then that there were 70 nations of the descendants of Adam, which would include the Canaanites, that would make up these civilizations before the flood and one presumes that these nations would have had gods or angels assigned to them and would have been the antediluvian council of gods as it's recorded in psalm 82 and then if some of those ones that say let's say as poseidon in the greek account as being the god of atlantis if he went to the abyss for creating Nephilim as one of the impassioned ones, then he would have had to have been replaced after the flood by another angel. So the number stays the same. The amount of nations that are going to be created after the flood are, are the same. And that they're all going to have a council of gods and one god in particularly representing that and probably several other gods underneath in, in the hierarchy. So if somebody wants a detailed document on Deuteronomy 32 and the Council of Gods, get a hold of me. I've got uh, a very a good explanation on that and as to why the King James Version in this case has an accurate translation as the sons of Israel. And I understand in other translations it might say the sons of God. Um, as opposed to the sons of Israel. And I'll show you in that document why 
that all means the same thing. So get a hold of me if you want that document. Definitely, it's worth the study. I, I definitely think that if you haven't heard of that before, you should definitely reach out for that document as I'm sure that Gary prepared it very well to give you a thorough answer and clarity to exactly what's going on there. So we have four more questions left. We have about 17 minutes. Maybe we can get through them. And I, I'm not sure if we're going to get to any live questions, but just so everyone knows, if you did submit a live question tonight, we will go ahead and add that to the list for our next month's AMA with Gary Wayne. Uh, so this next question comes from Milford as well. What is the history of Egypt in general from the time of Atlantis to soon after the time of Noah's flood? Well, it was one of the greater nations of the antediluvian epoch, and it has a history of its gods and a very rich history as an important civilization and as being part of the Atlantean Confederation. And so very much closely associated with Atlantis in the um, Atlantean mythos. And of course, um, we get the parent gods, which we know are antediluvian, those are the Ogdod gods, and includes Ta and Ra and Anubis and, and so on and so forth. So it has a very rich part of the antediluvian history. After the flood, and again, the pyramids, I think, are pre flood, and we actually get um, depictions of uh, the Great Pyramid on, uh, you know, on some scrolls and tablets around the time of Menes, which is around 3000 BC by secular chronology and just before the flood. So by, um, I guess, biblical chronology, I would probably place that around 25 or 2600 BC. So after the flood, we know the pyramids are located in the same location and they weren't destroyed if you buy into the concept that they were made before the flood and i think they were just renovated by um uh, cheops and kephra and all of the the pharaohs around around that area who are you know associated with uh, the pyramids so after the flood you have the descendants of noah coalescing as one people and going down the mountain, and within, say, 70 years thereabouts, they start to build the city of Babel, and Nimrod becomes the leader. And he is going to have a rebellion against God and build the tower and set up this Babylon, Babel religion. And Babel religion is the root for the Babylon allegory of the religion of the end time, just as Nimrod is an antichrist type archetype figure. So after Babel, and understanding that the descendants were in Shinar, which is a transliteration for Sumer in Mesopotamia, and Nimrod is going to stay there, he is going to continue with this Babel religion after uh, Babel and in Sumer, but Mizraim is going to travel to Egypt, and in the Masonic traditions, he'll travel with Hermes, and they're going to set up the second pillar of the mystical religions that between both of them are going to spread those religions to all the other people um, of the whole Mediterranean area, and then it, that gets exported around the world. Um, that we know today as all the different pantheons and religions of the post-Diluvian area. So Egypt is going to develop as one of the great empires, and I think as, as one of the seven empires that are talked about in Revelations. And, in, and I know that's got a dual application in um, Daniel with uh, uh, Greece and those kingdoms that follow after Alexander and then Rome and then the end time empire and the both they add up to seven. So I think there's a dual application in that understanding. So Egypt is a very, very important uh, empire that is part of that history of empires and part of that history of empires that is partnered with the mystical Babel religion. All right, thank you for the answer. The next one comes from Anonymous. Could the synagogue of Satan be using the Islamic Empire as a counterfeit antichrist? Since we know the synagogue of Satan claims to be Jews, but are not. The deception seems to be layered. 
Well, I don't think that Islam claims to be Jewish people. I think they claim to, uh, at least the organized religion part, claim to uh, be a successor to, uh, you know, the God of the Jews and all of the blessings through the various things that they like to talk about. Um, not that any of that's in the Quran, but that's the Hadith and the organized religion part. So I'm not sure that this would be an Islamic empire. Typically, I think this would be people faking themselves as being Jews and are Satan worshippers or Kabbalists and or mystics. Um, now, I may be wrong, but that's how I understand the synagogue of Satan in the end time. So you've got a lot of people in the current Jewish mix that may not be Jewish people, and a lot of them will be part of the Kabbalist or mystical religions that are also connected to the secret societies whom their god is Satan. And so I think that's what it's being that's what's being talked about as the synagogue of Satan. At least that's my understanding of it. All right, thank you very much. The next one also comes from Anonymous. How much of the Antichrist Beast Kingdom is already in power? And how do you think current alliances will shift when the full kingdom is established? <sighs> Well, we don't really have uh, the Antichrist system in place yet because he sort of in inherits the final product. Uh, what we have is a new world order being shaped up for the Ten Kings as the Beast Kingdom that Antichrist will take over. So I understand the Ten King Beast Empire to be groups of nations or spheres of influences and or trading blocks. And so you could look at um, the NAFTA or now the, uh, the new free trade agreement that includes Canada, U.S. and Mexico as a trading block. It may change and um, there may be Mexico dropped and maybe Britain comes in or something like that. You have the European economic community that I think will split into two, into two separate groups of nations. I think you're going to have a Russian dominated sphere of influence and in countries. I think you're going to have a China dominated area. I think you're going to have an India dominated area. So we see the genesis of that happening and they're, and the Club of Rome has already, in their planning, divided the world up into those ten groups of nations. And the Club of Rome reports to the Rosicrucians and, and the Committee of 300. And there's two levels of each there um, when you understand the hierarchical order. Uh, and I think that we're well on our ways, but we're certainly not there yet. And they're being pushed back. But the geopolitical scenario is kind of just, you know around right and this geopolitical scenario can be looked at in terms of the alliance of nations in part that's going to be part of that gog alliance and so when we start looking at who's in that alliance that's going to be part of that 10 groups of nations so you know i would expect in the middle east you're going to have a persian dominated group right and you're going to have i think a north african dominated a group or it could be all of africa as one group of nations so i think we're well on our way geopolitically but we still got a ways to go to sort of firm that up and i think it's going to take more catastrophes and calamities to come along to cement that and then it's going to take babylon rising with its false prophets of doom and antichrist to negotiate that final beast kingdom that antichrist will take over at the three and a half year point of the last seven all right thank you for that answer our next question comes from iron fist is the pillar of lamech discussion or discussed in scriptures or only in books outside of scriptures yeah we don't get a description or an accounting of the pillars of lamech or the pillars of enoch and there's different masonic legends on that and there are similar types of legends outside of the Masonic legends that are talking about the same sort of uh, bank of information or information leading to that bank of information where uh, that knowledge is hidden. So that is definitely not scriptural. It is polytheist, but it's what they believe and that's what's important and what they do with that belief. For people who may not be know knowing what 
Anonymous is referring to in the Masonic history as, and in their creation with the seven sacred sciences that Enoch, son of Cain, uh, develops from the knowledge Cain learned from Adam, who Adam got that information from um, God in Eden. Cain develops this knowledge into the seven sacred sciences that we would recognize as the seven liberal sciences today. And to guard and to develop that knowledge and ensure it's not falling into the hands of the mundane as they would look at it in the craft as or the poor or pure blood humans, uh, as opposed to being the blood of Nephilim or hybrid Nephilim, they're going to develop the mystical religion and the mystery schools to um, hide this and develop this information and keep it away from uh, the mass of the population and only for the elite. What happens is that Enoch and or Lamech recognize the flood is coming and so they don't want to lose this bank of knowledge. And so on the two pillars of Lamech or the two pillars of Enoch, there's two different Masonic legends on that. Um, this knowledge is written down into 36,525 books stacked on nine vaults hidden underneath the pyramids that Hermes finds after the flood, finds the pillars, finds the knowledge, takes that back to Nimrod at Babel where the knowledge comes to build the city. And Nimrod becomes the first Grand Master of Masons after the Flood and writes the first Constitution. So that's their version of biblical history. But there are some interesting cross-references there to um, the Bible because we get the same players written about in the Bible and the same activities. What we, what we learn from the Masonic account is why uh, Lamech's sons, Nama, Jubal, Jubal, and Tubal Cain are listed, and you get a version of some of those sciences and arts as they're listed in Genesis, and you find out where this knowledge that is working as one people come from and one language in terms of the tower, trying to build a tower into heaven to take on God. So um, it starts to make some sense. So for context, it starts to make some sense, but those are that's a polytheist version of prehistory. All right, thank you. This is the last live question. It is 9.56, so this will probably be the last one before we wrap it up for tonight. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, this one also comes from Iron Fist. Who wrote the Targum? Is it uh, the Gnostics that wrote this book, or is it inspired? Mm. Uh, I would say neither uh, on that. Neither the Gnostics or the Mystics, although they will have an influence. And... Um, certainly it's, I'm, I'm not convinced it's inspired, although some will argue that it is inspired. So what the Targum is, is a version of the Old Testament. And Zen's got a very good book on the Targum, if you're interested in getting a copy. And he translates it, and he does an extraordinary job on it. What the Targum is, is written down in Aramaic. And what happens when the people of Judah are exiled in Babylon is the average Judaic person or the southern kingdom, the Jewish people, they lose their spoken language and their written language. And only the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Essenes, uh, the priests of those sects, can actually understand Hebrew. So when they're reading the text and they want to now explain the Torah to the people. They need to do it in the language of the spoken Jewish people, which has been now replaced with Aramaic. And it's sort of the commercial language as Greek will become later, which is why the New Testament was written down in Greek. I wish it was in Hebrew because we could match up the meanings of words a lot better between the Old and the New Testament. But I digress. So what happens with the Targum then is you now have the the rabbis injecting their understanding and trying to explain some of the verses better. So it's more of an oral tradition and an editorial comments being added into the Torah to try and help better explain some of the things that are going on in the original Hebrew Torah. So it's, you know, is it influenced by uh, the Kabbalists? 
who are part of the Gnostics, certainly possible because you get that Kabbalism sort of coming into Judaism from uh, their time in Babylon, and they get the Sumerian traditions involved in that. But you had an ascetic Heliopolis tradition from Egypt that was already part of the Judaic culture. So um, I'm not convinced of that. There may be some of that influence in terms of how they interpret or add on to some of the verses, um, but I'm not there to go to say that that's a Gnostic influence, um, but it's possible. Uh, and it's not inspired. The inspired version is the Torah version, in my opinion, uh, and there are some different changes or additions to um, what is written into the Targum than what is written down in Scripture. So uh, it's an interesting read and use it for context, and I would recommend anybody read it. Yeah, definitely. It's an interesting read. And there are more than just the, the Torah. There are a lot of the prophets found as well uh, that we have Aramaic Targums of. And really most interesting to me is that there's actually two different forms of Aramaic that were used in the Targum that we have on the Torah. Mm -hmm. And there was an, an older Aramaic, and then there was one that actually uh, was used after the time of the Messiah. And the older one is the bulk of the text, which is probably you know where the original translation from one of the older manuscripts of the Torah was uh, copied. But the newer version of the Aramaic seems to have been a lot of commentary. So definitely you have to study it with a grain of salt and absolutely, you know, read everything that you can. The Greek Septuagint, the Masoretic text, and, and compare everything. And the Holy Spirit will guide you to truth. And prayerfully you've been guided to a lot of truth through this study. And we appreciate you all joining us. Uh, lastly, Gary, could you let everyone know one more time where they could find you? and where they could get your awesome book, The Genesis 6 Conspiracy. So to the best way to get a hold of me and or to get a copy of my book is through my website, which is the Genesis 6 Conspiracy.com, www.genesis6, the number 6 Conspiracy.com. On that website, I've got a generous excerpt of all 98 chapters. You can link over to buy a signed copy from me, or you could also link over to get a digital version for uh, in a Kindle version. Uh, and you can link over to Amazon and also over to Barnes & Noble. So that's the easiest way to, to get a hold of the book. Um, and if you want to get a hold of me, there's an email access to me uh, on the uh on the uh, website, which is the uh, which is Genesis Six Conspiracy at Gmail dot com, Genesis Six Conspiracy at Gmail dot com. That's the uh, website email address. Get a hold of me for that if you want to ask me a question or if you want some of the documents that I've talked about. And if you do want a document, please give me the subject area because I do a lot of shows every week and I never remember all the different things I said. I promise in terms of documents on each show. You can also get a hold of me through Messenger. Uh, on Facebook or onto my timeline, ask me a question there, or uh, through Twitter at GaryWayne63 at GaryWayne63. All right. Thank you very much. And definitely we appreciate your hard work, Gary. We know that you've been so busy streaming for five hours yesterday until 1 a.m. And we really appreciate you joining us. Thank you so much. And, you know, you just you really pour your heart out do service for the most high and, and we can see that and we really appreciate it and thank you very much and we pray that your reward is kept up in heaven most certainly in the messiah's name amen uh, would you do us a favor and close us out in prayer sure father in heaven we thank you for giving us the opportunity to get together and ask questions and exchange information and hopefully by doing so and in the process learning more and digging deeper in and that we can take this information and plant more seeds and bring more people uh, valuable information in the times that we live in and certainly we ask for your guidance and your blessings and that you help us in this time of need now between the COVID and all of the rioting and protesting and tensions that are going on out there that we you can help us and through us bring a spirit of peace and cooperation and get back to 
living our lives and glorifying you as our God and your son, Jesus, who is our redeemer. And we pray that not only can we get back to a little bit of normality and more of uh, what I would call role modeling, um, you know, how you want us to live and that people will take a step back and reflect on that and that uh, better times uh, will be coming. We do know that we may be living in turbulent times and so what happens happens and we ask that you give us the patience and the wisdom to be able to help us navigate not only ourselves through these times but to help others navigate through this period of time as well. And we pray these things in the name of our Redeemer, the word Jesus, who sits at your right hand side and testifies to you for us and for all of the saints. And we also pray in the name of the Holy Spirit, in your great and holy name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you very much again for joining us, everybody. And if we didn't get to your question, we will have it added for next month's show. We will be airing live again on the first Monday of July at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. God willing. And much love to you, Gary. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's, uh, it's uh, been fun, and uh, and I really enjoyed tonight, even though I'm, I'm starting to get a little bit tired. <laughs> well, it's definitely time for you to settle in and get some rest. And we appreciate you, everyone. Shalom. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Every day, questions arise. Are the stories in the Bible true? What if I told you that there are hundreds of confirming witnesses which give intricate detail to the stories in the Bible? Have you ever found yourself deep in the rabbit hole with questions that no one seemed to have the answers to? Join us the first Monday of every month at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on the Endeavor Freedom YouTube channel for our Ask Me Anything series with author and researcher Gary Wayne as he sheds light on the mysteries which have us all searching together.